Driving down the highway, roll down the window, watch it go. What the nomads are doing is not that different than what the pioneers did. One of the things I love most about this life is that there's no final goodbye. Drifting. Let's just say I'll, I'll see you down the road. So that was a clip from the Academy Award winning film Nomadland, which is kind of who I'm interviewing today. Uh, my good and dear friend Porter Palmer, who uh, with her husband have been living maybe not quite the same kind of lifestyle. They live in quite a nice um, motorhome and um, it might not be quite at that same level, but it's the same concept of, of living on the road. They've been doing it for years and I visit him visited them as they've um, stationed themselves in various parts of uh, the United States. And uh, it's been just uh, an interesting um, uh, thing for me to pay attention to and watch. And I'm so excited to be able to have Porter on today to talk a little bit more about what it's like to live uh, without a, a home, a stationary home. It's still a home, but it's just not a stationary home. So enjoy my conversation with Porter. Well, I am excited today because I have one of my dearest friends on the show, as, I, as I've sort of uh, alluded to perhaps in other episodes. First of all, I don't know what episode number this is going to be because I've already recorded about four of these interviews. I haven't released one of them yet, and so I don't know how I'm going to order them. So I don't know if you're the fourth, the first, the fifth. It doesn't matter. We'll see uh, how good I am. Well, maybe, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, uh, this is one of my dearest friends. So first, the first thing I do is just a real quick intro of yourself as a professional, who you are, where you are, what you do. Okay, so hi, I'm Porter Palmer, and I taught special education and worked with um, adults and students with disabilities for more than a decade in South Carolina before I left the classroom to focus on um, building curriculum and assessments for kids with significant disabilities, which is quite the niche um, that I was in. And then through that work of working with teachers, um, I found a passion for connecting educators to one another in a community space. And so that really excited me. And so I have spent the last Oh, 15 years of my career working in community and social media. I'm currently um, at Leone Consulting Group, which is a small boutique marketing agency, digital marketing agency run by my good friend, Ilana Leone. Um, and I've been working there a couple of years and we help brands do social media, newsletters, the thing that I'm most passionate about, though, is helping brands build communities and specifically communities for teachers. Although we do dabble in communities for parents as well, my passion is really around teacher communities. Okay, so how do we know each other? So you, okay, I've known you a long time. Um, you are the first person that I ever watched go live on, like, like Ustream or whatever it was at the time, like this is way back um, when Twitter was a baby. And so I worked at Discovery Communications at the time. And then a few years later, you joined that team. And so we worked together at Discovery Ed Building the Den. And those were most wonderful days of working. And we that. engaged in... We engaged in shenanigans. And oh, all sorts of shenanigans. <laughs> that, was really, that was such a good, good time. Anyway, so all of that professional stuff, we're just going to put way over to the side because that's not what we want to talk about today. So um, when, uh, I think right from the start when uh, I met you, I remember in 2012, uh, we had our summer institute out in Bozeman, Montana. And you and your husband, Bill, came out there in a 
fifth wheel trailer. Was it the fifth wheel? No. We didn't have wasn't the fifth it? wheel was yet. It, it was, it was, was just it a regular have? pull behind just a RV. Trailer? Yeah, okay. it's just a trailer. Okay. We're on number three so, now. All right. So so uh, the reason that you're here is to talk about your life as as a homeless remote. <laughs> I don't even know what what the term a what full this, time what the term. RVer. <laughs> a full time RVer. Yeah. Now, talk. So that was my sort of first. T tell me how you sort of transitioned from having a home in Michigan to that. Like, what was? How did sure. that come about? What was? How did that evolve? Okay, so it actually starts before then. So when we were living in San Antonio, Texas, um, Bill was working at a radio station. I was working for um, Discovery Ed, but I was working remotely. And um, we, my stepson was graduating high school, fleeing the nest, and we were going to find ourselves empty nesters. This was around 2008, 2009. The economy here in the United States was sort of taking tanking at the time. And so we started thinking about how hard we were working to make the house payments on that two-story neighborhood home and the cars and the this and the that. And we started just thinking, like, what do we need? That was the question that we asked each other is what do we need? And we realized that we did not need as much as we had. And so we were inspired. We went to Terlingua, Texas, which is way out in West Texas. And there are groups of people who were living off the grid there. They were building, this is, you know, more than a decade ago. They were building container houses and um, off-grid living arrangements. And we were really inspired by that, but we started and we wanted to buy land there. You could pick up 20, for $6,000, you could pick up 20 acres. Now this is bad land, so people don't really want that, which is why it was so affordable. There are harsh winters and harsh summers in that area, so it makes living there tough. And so I, we thought, you know what, instead of having a small tiny house in this one location, what if we just bought an RV and we could take it to Terlingua when we wanted to be there, and then when the weather is really tough, we could leave and go somewhere else. And so that planted the seed back in 2008 or 2009. We sold our house in San Antonio and moved to Michigan into my husband's grandparents' house in order to help us make this leap. And so we planned for several years. And when you saw me in 2012, that was part of the planning. We still had this house that was more affordable, but that meant we were able to buy the RV and be able to leave the house behind for a little while, not worry about the maintenance so much, hire somebody to cut the grass and then take this longer trip. And that was one of our that was one of our biggest trips was to go out to Montana in 2012. We had just bought our first RV in 2011 in November. We did that one big trip. We did a trip down south for the winter, realized that we needed something bigger. And that's when we got the fifth wheel, which just a year later, like right after Montana, we realized this is too small. And now you're in a uh, motor home. Like you said, this is your third. Now we're, uh, now we're third. in a motor home. We've had it for, it'll be two years in July. So talk about, um, and again, not that any year is typical. And of course this year is, is, is certainly untypical, but like just in general, like what, what is sort of the, the mindset of like how you sort of scope out? Cause you, you don't stay, you stay in some places, for longer than others yeah. so like what's yeah. what's sort of the philosophy i guess of how you live remotely and where you choose to go sure so we use a system that we sort of call a stake in the ground system and that is it seems that other people and their lives because we don't live in a vacuum obviously other people and their lives and the thing that we love impact our travel 
for example, my brother turned 60 years old um, in 2019. And I knew that he wanted us there for his birthday. So on his birthday, which was in September, which is a time that you don't really want to be in South Carolina because it's very hot there. We try to follow good weather and not be too hot or too cold. So that's one of the things. But then there's the stake in the ground of my daddy turning 90, a wedding someplace will put a stake in the ground that says we need to be at this location on this date then this gets complex but because we still work we tend to only travel on weekends so we'll then get out a big map and start from where we are to where that stake in the ground is and start looking at it in ways of like one week or one day segment so that we're only traveling on weekends most of the time. And we work our way there and we think about what's in between there that we might want to visit. Like what are the key, what friends are in the area that we might want to check in with that it makes sense for us. So there's a stake in the ground. I'll tell you like right now we have for the year 2021, two more stakes in the ground that I can just come up with off the top of my head. We have a wedding in the Wisconsin, Illinois border area at the end of July. And then we were supposed to go to the balloon fiesta in Albuquerque, New Mexico in October of 2020, but it was canceled. They transferred all of the reservations over to this year. So our next stake in the ground is the beginning of October in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So we work to map between this place in Illinois that we're going to be in July and where we know we want to be October 1st in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we plan a route of places in between there that allow us to stay generally about a day, about a week, sometimes two. Tell me about um, a place that you visit that perhaps surprised you. Like was like, you know, cause right now I know you're in Orlando and you love Disney and, and that's kind of a thing you guys like doing. Everybody knows about that, but tell me about a place that you said, you know what, this was a surprising place. We, we came across and, and, and uh, spent significant time there or plan to go back again. I think for me, I'll tell you every place first, like that's the answer is every place is amazing. Every place is wonderful, but I will tell you about one that changed me. How about that? Is that fair enough? Mm -hmm. um, sure. Quartzsite, Arizona is known as the boondocking capital of the world. Snowbirds flock there every winter and this small town goes from a handful of people living there to hundreds of thousands of people. This is a remote area. It is close to the border of California. So it's way far in Western Arizona. And when we got there, we we're not boondocking. We were staying in a campground because we weren't sure what our internet situation would be. And internet is the second biggest concern. It's actually the biggest concern, but then there's something else that's like the hardest part of our thing. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But we go into this campground in, in far west Arizona. And I see for the first time people who were living in tents in that campground and not by choice, but by their circumstances. And it was very eye opening for me because most of the time I live in these campgrounds where there's the majority of people are retirees. They are choosing this lifestyle. They have a house somewhere else. And that was really challenged for me. In that first, in that first moment, in that first moment, I felt really far away from home. I was way far away because I was way on the other side of the country from where I grew up in my little bubble of South Carolina. But I saw people using this lifestyle to survive. 
in a much different way than I had seen it before. And the shortest version of the story is people are people. And I wasn't far from home. I felt like I was for just a minute. But 10 minutes later, one of the people who lived in one of the tents, um, you know, invited us to where they were playing music that night. And music is the great connector. So I sat around the campfire and communed with wonderful people and let go of the things that had held on to me, I suppose, or fears that I might have had of unfamiliar people or unfamiliar circumstances and made friends with folks. And I can't wait to go back to Quartzite. And Quartzite's not the top of my list of favorite places or anything, but I learned some, I learned so much about myself and it, I changed, I changed in that moment. That's cool. So, okay. So you, you, you mentioned internet and like, so my question is, and you can maybe respond with, with, with the hardest, what's, what is the hardest thing about remote living? And maybe that gets to what you were going to talk about before. What's the most, sure, I mean, the hardest part is mail. People want to send, I, I love um, holiday cards. And so we always use my parents address for that, but like my birthday will come along and somebody will want to send something. And for my birthday this year, I actually said to people, all I want for my birthday is to not worry about whether there's a package coming or mail coming, or I just, that is the thing I don't want to deal with. Here's why. So we don't have an address. I could send something to my parents, but my daddy's 90 and blind. So they can't, they, they shouldn't be driving to try to take this to, to the post office for me. Like that's just, so we have a mail service, but a lot of campgrounds that we stay in, they don't want to receive United States postal service because that helps establish this is a residence for you and people will play that game of establishing a residence. So I can't get just a regular card. I can usually get packages through UPS or FedEx, but getting snail mail is the hardest part mm. of this lifestyle. That's interesting. Wouldn't have thought about that. Right. What about, um, yeah. So what, what's the, the sort of uh, luxury I, cause obviously you have to make a lot of choices in living where you live, but what's the, like the luxury thing that you have that you just like, you spent maybe more money than you might've, but like, this is the thing that we need in order to really feel like, uh, oh, know, to feel like we're home. home oh, that's very interesting. I mean, probably the RV itself, <laughs> right. like, like we've, we've, um, dialed in on what we need I mean the thing that comes to mind of all things is like the Keurig like uh -huh. the coffee maker but there are so many other things like that's not a big splurge um we have a lot of solar so on I guess our, like we have a lot of solar yeah, and I guess I guess the other thing is like just sort of your relationship with your home. So I think about my own wife who, you know, she just loves decorating that whole thing. So that's like, and so you're always, and, and sometimes even if you don't want to, you're forced to spend money on your home because it needs upkeep or whatever. Do you have, uh, is it a, is it a slightly different relationship than with your home in terms of like it, like things it's like we have a sort of a good enough attitude or are you constantly upgrading or adding like I'm just wondering if that that's a sure. different relationship it's a different relationship I think I think it could be different for different people I'll tell you like we've talked about that this is our third rig so our first rig was just a pull behind camper we determined that it was um just not suited for full-time living there wasn't a comfortable place for us to sit and it, like and hang out and when you are when you are full time, that is different than camping. When you camp, wow. you spend a lot of time outside. But if you are snowbirding, wintering in Florida or Arizona or any place that is warmer, your days still end really early. It gets dark at six mm -hmm. o'clock. 
And so you do find yourself spending more time inside. So you need a comfortable place to sit. And so that is the main reason we changed rigs to the fifth wheel. So we moved into a 33 foot brand new fifth wheel and we lived in it for seven years and we were very happy with it. However, it was a lightweight model. And as we started thinking about things we wanted to change about it, we realized that it wasn't, the, I'm going to say quality, but I don't want to put down the quality. It was fine, but it wasn't made for full-time living for decades. And so we started thinking, well, if I want to change the furniture or change any of these things, this quality of rig isn't the one I want to invest in. And that's why we wound up in this rig that we have which is we went back in time. We bought, we had a 2013 model of fifth wheel and we bought a 1999 country coach motorhome, 40 foot long. And we said, if there are any changes that we want to make, it will be to this rig that weighs tens of thousands of pounds and has real wood inside and those sorts of things. So we found this in July of 19 and it was just already perfect for us. We needed to change one thing. We changed a recliner with, that was a, a red color, that um, ox blood or whatever it's called. Um, we changed it with an off-white one that we bought at Costco. So like, that's the only change that we really need. I've hung a picture or two. You'll see that one right there. Um, but otherwise, besides hanging pictures and putting our special touches, we've not needed to do anything to this rig yet. That doesn't mean that we won't someday. Yeah, no. And so what would you, what advice would you give to somebody who's saying, gee, this, this lifestyle seems interesting, enticing. I'd like to, I'd like to dip my toe in the water or get to like, what advice do you give to people who are thinking about um, this kind of lifestyle? Sure. Buy used, buy used. <laughs> Number one thing, especially if you are the dipping your toes in the water, it doesn't even matter what rig, because I mean, we've been doing this 10 years and I'm on my, our third rig, but whatever rig you get probably won't be your last one. So just buy used so that you don't, take that hit right away. That's hard advice. People don't like that. We just learned it the hard way. You can get so much better for so much less if you go back in time. Um, start with short trips. If you're going to be working, make sure that you have solid internet that you can bring with you. That's a, that's a real thing if you are a, a working age person. We spend a lot of money on our internet we have both Verizon and AT&T and make sure that we can use both of them. Um, and then just do it. This is the best life. This is the best life. So just do it. You need fewer things. Um, trade in those things for adventures. If you're just getting your feet wet, get a house sitter and do it anyway. Like leave your stuff and get a house sitter and try a short trip run somewhere for winter or go somewhere for summer, do a month. Well, it's been interesting. It's been interesting sort of, you know, following your, your journey and knowing that, you know, this is certainly not a fleeting uh, uh, interest that you're, you're all in on this and, and are quite content to continue this way for as long as you can, I'm sure. Uh, the oh, last yeah. question I'm going to ask, and, and the answer can be none, but the answer might be, how has this lifestyle impacted you as uh, as an educator like it or is there sort of any connection to that or is it like no no it's just how it like and that's fine if there isn't but if there is what is what how has that impacted you i think i know the answer to this one but i'll let you i'll let you do it um i will say how it has impacted me as a community builder for educators because it I mean, I'll just be, you know, up front. It's been many years since I was in a classroom. And so while I love teachers and I advocate for them, and while I do still consider myself an educator, I educate adults mostly. Anyway, how it's changed me is um, a community builder. 
Um, if you go spend any time in these RV parks where there are seasonal people, you will see that they have created a community in real life right there where people have job, voluntary jobs that they, ways that they contribute. And so just being able to observe humans and how they interact with one another in a in-person community setting has helped me empathize more with people um, in online community settings and to internalize how community is built and works and how you help people step forward and become more active in a community. Well, a, a full disclosure, I knew that answer because you've shared that with me uh, <laughs> over a while. So I already knew the answer to that one, but that was good. Anyway, thank you so much, Porter, for taking the time to do this. My my uh, dream is that uh, I will, I, I saw Bill post sort of where you're going and wanted to know if people could connect. And you know, once I can get on an airplane again and come your way, I hope to line that up and, and uh, that. spend some time with you because it's always a joy and just to watch you guys uh, in your world and lifestyle. So thank you so much for doing this for me. You're very welcome. I would do anything for you. I thank you for um, igniting my passion for the word joy. You opened my eyes to that and I am forever grateful for that. I have not told you, but I got to pick my own title at work this past week and I chose director of joy. Ah, way to go. Good job. Good for you. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Well, be well. Say hi to Bill. Thank you.